So our first presenter is going to be Sue Parks. And I will, without any further ado, she's the uh, CEO of United Way Orange County. We all look to her for a great amount of guidance, and she does not disappoint. So Sue, you're welcome. that we have. 
have in terms of what we need to get done. So, I don't know, should I put, okay. So as, as United Way, these are four strategic goals. They were done over an 18 month process with education involved, academia was involved, government was involved, businesses were involved, nonprofits were involved. We all sat around a table and facilitated this 18 month strategic planning process to achieve um, these four goals that you see. And when we focused on the homeless and housing insecure children, what that was originally based on is what Jeff's going to talk quite a bit about on those 27,000, 28,000 children that are living, they're going to our schools, um, but are living in housing insecure situations or even homeless. And there might be, what, 1,200 of those that might be a, really what one would say homeless, living in shelters, et cetera. And the rest are maybe uh, triple, quadruple up in apartments, they're living in motels, they're um, living in um, areas that none of us would want our children to live, especially when we want them focused on their education. So the United Way stepped up to really look at that particular area and said, how can we help? In 2014, when we started this uh, strategic planning process, and we started doing some things, for example, putting financial literacy centers, financial hubs in um, schools in disadvantaged areas, we call those spark points. And what we want to do is find when a child's parents know that they're having problems making ends meet and they can't pay their rent and feed their children, that there's a safe place they can go to get help and get into the system so they don't have to pull their child from school. So we started funding those programs, rapid rehousing for parents who've lost their way and gotten them involved in that. Um, so what rapid rehousing refers to is um, the family, somebody with a family can get in a, back into a home relatively quickly and then they get subsidized on their rent so they can get back um, they can get back on their feet and going forward so they never have to be homeless and they can get on with their life in a humane and dignified way. So we were funding these and um, you know felt really good about all that, but on the other hand, we started looking at the overall homelessness issue in Orange County and it was getting worse and worse. And in that end, we pulled together a lot of nonprofits, we pulled together the um, um, Association of California Cities, Orange County, and others and said, you know, what is going on? Let's learn more. And in that process, um, Jamboree Housing, um, the United Way, and the ACCOC commissioned UCI and hence Dr. Snow in doing the definitive study on homelessness in Orange County. And for those of you who aren't familiar with it, um, we have copies, some of copies in the back but it's available online. How many of you are familiar with the cost study? This is an awesome audience, because I did this Friday morning and no. So, the, um, so anyway, that you know this, this is fabulous. So if you don't, this is really um, a, such a wonderful tool for us to talk facts and the spellness of what's going on in Orange County. Um, and so we, we commissioned that, and then out of there, it came a series of recommendations, and hence, that is how United 10 Homelessness got started. But the next part of our journey on this, this is the cost study and the recommendations that I'm not expecting you to read, but we're going to talk more about, about them. Um, but what happened um, after we did this is we went and searched best practices. So those of you in business understand the importance of finding best practices. And we found a couple communities really that had done a remarkable thing. So for example, Orlando, Florida, which has about 3.2 million people. How many people does Orange County have? Orange County County here? About 3.2 million people. And they had about the same issue in their point of time count. 4,700, 4,800 people were um, street homeless in their point of time count or in that, in the, around that number. And they had cut that number in half in three years. And so that was pretty remarkable compared to other communities that we had seen. And we looked at other markets, but there were so many good parallels that we decided to see what we could do to, um, to imitate, not imitate, to take the best things that they were doing and how could we apply their learnings. And so we didn't have to develop everything ourselves. And the biggest thing that came out of it is government is doing a wonderful job, but government can't do it alone. Right? This, this, that was one of the big things that um, our friends in Orlando taught us, that we all need to come to the table, business and education and government and nonprofit. And that's how United to, get to and Homelessness got started. 
So here's what the backdrop is, and again, I'm going through this really quickly because I know that you all know a lot about this, but as I said, the last point in time count here in Orange County was in 2017, and the total was around 47, 4,800 people, and it's broken down in these different definitions, so street homelessness, sheltered homeless, and then the Kenny Vento, which is the population that, again, is in our school system, the children and how they're measured is different than how HUD measures homelessness. And so again, it's different numbers to be aware of. But when I look at this, these numbers, and just so you know, there is going to be a new point of time count done in the end of January, and it's a volunteer opportunity, and there's gonna be information, I'm encouraging all of you, and I'll say this many times for you, to sign up to united to homelessnessorg and keep apprised of ways to get involved and how you can help. But at the end of January, there's gonna be a full census type of count versus an extrapolated count. And we know this number, these numbers will go up, not because the situation has gone up, it's just gonna be better counted. So I think starting in February or whenever we get numbers back, and I'll let the Judson lead on that, is that we're gonna know really what, we're, what the situation here. But plan that these numbers will go up. But again, this is what we're starting for. But regardless if they go up by a third, how I look at this, we are 3.2 million people. There are a couple thousand people that need our help and we can do that. As a community, we can come together mm -hmm. and help. So anyway, so that's just what we knew back in 17. Again, those numbers will change. Some of you might say, but what about here? How many of you are in, live in Newport Beach? So again, so maybe half. Okay, so South, this is the service planning areas, and this is how the county has divided the, the communities so that there are ways that um, communities can say how can we measure and um, you know, get people into the system and have them understand what's going on in different parts of our community. So this just breaks down that um, the population um, into what we know right now in terms of the unsheltered homeless. And I think big and bold up there is 357 um, unsheltered veterans, right? And that's just a staggering number, and I think a number that all of us would want to see be zero, right? And, and other communities have done that. They've reached functional zero very quickly in veterans with the whole community coming together. And I know, again, that we can do that too. Um, so the, the cost study, so for those of you who are well familiar with it, here's just some other information that were ahas that, again, dispel some myths that um, there's a lot of um, feeling that people are just coming into our community um, randomly or, you know, being shipped here from other communities. And at the end of the day, and the research showed and the amazing things that Dr. Snow um, and team did, they found out that 68% of those surveyed, and this was how many? It was like 262. 250, yeah. Yeah, 200, yeah um, 250 actual interviews with people besides all the government data. That's a big sampling. 68% um, have lived here over 10 years. So when you hear people say they've just come into the community, that's not what the research shows. Um, primarily US born, um, middle aged white male were the biggest percentage in terms of um, who the, our homeless are. And what were the causes of homelessness? And so again, speaking to people that are really well versed, but just as a reminder, um, the jobs that have a sustainable wage, that um, again, that combination of a wage and then having someplace affordable to live, a pretty daunting task in Orange County for many in terms of going on, and then family issues. And it, with women, that ended up being things like domestic violence, et cetera. But it could be an illness, it could be um, you know, a, a divorce, or something else that's gone on in their lives. And so this also has been an aha. I was with a business group in another community on Monday and talking about this issue, and um, the skepticism that, that this isn't more heavily weighted than somebody with a dependency issue. And I have a conversation with our expert on this, as well as many in the care community, um, the service providers. And at the end of the day, if somebody's um, maybe more vulnerable as they get into this state, right? And then, at the, and also, if any of us lived on the street for any period of time, we're going to develop some type of an issue, right? And 
if you read the paper, how many read the stories in the, the register this morning about Rita and Laura, the two women? If you have, I mean, I, I, you were probably as emotionally impacted when you read those as I do, but if you read one, one of these, these two women were killed in separate auto accidents, both had um, many years in the homeless, living in homeless here in Orange County, and that growing roster of people who have died here. Um, but the, the message in terms of that particular, um, one of the, the woman's stories is that she had developed an illness and so she was living on the street with an illness and she started self-medicating because she didn't know what else to do. She didn't have the resources to take care of herself. Which reminds me again of a story of, of a gentleman you'll hear more about as we expand public awareness on this name, Brian. And Brian is an example of somebody who grew up very fluent in your Belinda. And he, um, his mom had um, hotels and restaurants, etc. And he did like a lot of young people with aspirations to change the world, went off to a foreign country to teach English and to help people. And while he was in another country, he started not feeling well. He came back to help himself, you know, get better. And at the time, his mom passed away. And he found out he had MS. And so he couldn't manage a company, he had no idea what he was doing, went bank, you know, the, bank, the business went bankrupt, and he's now living on the streets with MS, and obviously struggling to go on, but he never did start off that way, right? It's just different circumstances to lead. And I think of all of you who understand this to help educate our neighbors and other people in our life that how somebody ended up on the streets doesn't necessarily mean what their life is like when they're on the streets and what they need to do to manage that. Um, so anyway, this was the big aha to the business community. So I was talking to one of the CEOs of a big organization here a few months ago and I was talking about the emotional, talking from the heart. And then I said this, I said, well, do you know how much this costs us as a community to um, keep people on the streets and just managing homelessness versus solving it? or yeah, solving it and ending it in that humane and dignified way. And these were the amounts of money that were, um, again, studied in the cost, again, the cost study that Dr. Snow led. And so at the end, it totals $300 million a year. Orange County is spending at the time, and it's gotten bigger, um, but spending at the time on managing homelessness and not ending homelessness. So um, the cool thing out of this is they also did the the work on it by individual. So if you're a chronic, um, if you're somebody in a chronic um, condition, meaning that you're never going to be able to take care of yourself, that you are um, like Brian. I just mentioned Brian would be somebody. He's never going to be able to get that job to be on his, be on his throat. Rita in the paper would have never been able to get back on her feet. They would be termed chronic homeless. And if we house the chronic homeless, we would save $42 million. So that caught business aside. That caught his eye and said, I want to solve it. So head or heart, this is a, something, again, from a community, we can help come together and help a few thousand people. Um, so some of you might know what permanent supportive housing is. Everybody here might, <laughs> again, you're probably going, I know more than she does. <laughs> the, um, <laughs> the, um, so um, permanent and really this whole housing first model is what is the solution to homelessness and there are many different types so there's such a complicated issue and there's different solutions for different populations but there are these things going on in, in our community and I think if I printed this you saw the before before it got turned over this is what it looked like as an apartment community and how much nicer it looks now that it's permanent supportive housing so this is something that made the community look even better, right? And added to the area. And when somebody has permanent supportive housing, they come with care. They come with um, case management. So there's somebody, and we have apartment owners who are so helpful in the solution, and more to come on that. But what they're excited about is that I have a tenants right now who have a lot of problems, and I don't have anybody that can go in and reach them. And when I have somebody that's been brought in through this process with a voucher that comes with case management, I have somebody looking after them. I have somebody that's taking care of them and I don't have to worry. My rent's guaranteed and I've got somebody taking care of them versus somebody else down the road 
that might be in one of their apartments and they have no recourse but to ride out into the court system to try to get the change. But then, again, it's a better looking facility. And so this was um, in Santa Ana. I don't know if getting better about it. And this was turned into the orchard, which is really, and I think maybe Judson can talk a little bit more about that. But this just turned to be like this phenomenal model of what can be done um, in refurbishing. What was, this was once an old hotel, right? Once an old hotel. So again, when you hear this and people are worried about it, and again, not you and here, but that's why we need to build public awareness, that this is a really good thing. It makes the places better, and people come with care and helps them get off the streets, and it's the ultimate win-win. So we're very supportive of permanent supportive housing. The neighborhood gets together, it's great. So any homelessness is possible, and um, this idea of functional zero, which you're again, probably all familiar with, but that's the definition people use, because it's never truly ever going to end. There's always going to be somebody homeless. But the idea that we get caught up as a community and get the housing that we need and people in, but that we get to a point where homelessness is rare, that it's brief and it's non-recurring, that's the goal. And there's a whole system that does some things for the county that's extraordinary to make sure once we have the housing going here, there's a flow and we understand who needs what kind of services and it's all taken care of. And again, we're talking a few thousand people here in Orange County and we can do this. Um, and these are kind of the models that I said, there are other communities. Riverside beat us in any veterans homelessness and Mark's going, no, we're gonna be next, right? So, um, so we can do this. I mean, other communities have, have done it, so. And they did it with Housing First, which is what we've just been talking about. And they made a shift from at random acts of good things, hoping something like, to working collaboratively. And that's really the key. So there are good things happening. Um, again, you can ask more questions on this. There is a plan for the community. Um, and most of the cities have said, you know, we want to get involved, we want help. And if everybody does a, a bit of the solution, we can all come together and do that. So, being supportive of a community-wide and Orange County plan to build. But this is all based on cities being actively engaged. And there has been money put aside now. There's goes a bill on AB 448, so a housing trust fund. So there's going to be money, more money available to solve this and help people build out these kind of solutions. So there are some amazing things that have happened. And part of that is getting to this United Ten Homelessness is what, what we have been working on since February 28th when we brought together business and government and philanthropy and so many different uh, folks to the table to say let's end this together, let's do this. And you can see some of the names of people that are on there from um, Judson and Jeff are certainly on here. Larry Armstrong, who's the chair of, of this um, effort with us is the CEO of Where Malcolm, an internationally um, renowned architectural firm, and he, we've been so fortunate to have his leadership. But there are many people from the community that have come together um, to say we want to be part of the solution. Um, out of United Ten Homelessness, there were four things that came up. The first is public awareness, so we're so appreciative of Mark and Rabbi Marsha to letting us be here and sharing this message of what's going on. You're gonna see um, starting next, um, you might have seen actually there's an ad in the register. Um, in how many days? Well, on the 10th. On the 10th, yeah, November 10th um, and 11th. So next weekend we're gonna start um, for us a, a massive public awareness effort to hopefully help educate the public um, and to that this is an, an opportunity for us as a community to come together and do the right thing. It's all about starting about education. So we've got how many faith leaders? You think over 200? I think over 200 faith leaders that we're asking to share the same message from their um, in on their in their platforms, their podiums, through their members, through all of their different means. Um, there's a and I think Mark, you were instrumental in an editorial that's going to be in the register next week from the faith community saying. Let's do the right thing together. So the faith community is actively engaged. There's gonna be a wrap around the register next weekend. I'll do a plug for the register. If you don't buy it, go buy next weekend. No on Sundays because 
It's going to have a wrap around it. It's going to talk all about the good things that are going on in the community to end homelessness. Um, we have calling action for businesses on Monday, um, Veterans Day, to get involved. And we have CEOs um, sending out the message to their employees and to through their social media contacts to say get involved. There'll be billboards. There'll be bus shoulder ads. There'll be all sorts of different ways that we're trying to spread the word to drive people to come and message. And during that, that week, there's going to be three opportunities for you to share with your friends and other folks to get involved and learn about this issue. We're doing our Homelessness 101 classes in three different parts of the community, one in each of those service planning areas. So there's flyers when you leave on each of those so that you can see uh, where they're at. And there's one Tuesday night, Wednesday night, and Thursday night. So there's great ways for you all to get involved in that in education. So public awareness is huge. The data, we're going to leave that um, for um, Judson to talk a little bit more about that. But the idea of what's going on data and measuring success, and that point in time count is going to be critical in that. Um, the third area that we as um, United Homelessness have gotten really involved in is getting the rental um, market and the apartment owners. And if any of you are apartment owners, we'd love for you to be engaged. And Larry's going to talk a little bit about that when he's on the panel and talk about ways for the private market to get involved and be part of the solution. Orlando apartment owners stepped up, and these are private apartment owners, not the, the big um, Wall Street ones, that they were private apartment owners that said, we want to be part of the solution. Yes, we can house those 357 veterans. Yes, we can house um, you know, single women and families. They all came together to help the chronically homeless and the people that were most in need, including veterans. And they, I think, got like, close to 2,000 apartment owners, or 2,000 apartments. This is something that we can do together, and we've got a pilot going on you can hear more about. And then making sure there's funding aligned to support all those uh, initiatives as we go on. So these are the working groups. So there's faith, there's the service providers. I think I saw Helen here. So Helen from Amazing Jamory Housing kind of thing. I didn't know who was all in the audience, but we could hand more kind of thing. Jamory does amazing things in the space and can answer so many questions about what the nonprofit um, building community is doing. Um, service providers, funders, uh, faith leaders, rental, um, rental property owners, everybody's getting together to say we can end this. And again, partnering with government, hopefully like never before. Um, so the role of faith leaders, this is what your faith leader council are doing together in terms of this, help you with education, um, advocacy, and help you with the public awareness. And I know um, Mark and Dr. Or Rabbi Marsha can share more about that um, as well. On the public awareness campaign, you're going to hear more about just a sneak peek of some of the things that you might be seeing on billboards, et cetera. There's a public awareness, in the public awareness campaign, there's a proclamation. And so when you go to the website, the proclamation is at the, also on the table out there that we'd love for you to sign up and say that you're in and support if you haven't done so already. And now we're going to open it up, but I wanted, we wanted to do that little background effort. And so again, I hope that was helpful and not too redundant for all of you. Kind of set the stage of where we're at. So I've talked a lot about the role of different, um, um, different parts of our community as we all come together. So I'm going to ask Jeff Hittenberger to come on. Jeff is a, um, leads all the academic um, efforts for the Orange County Department of Education. So Judson Brown, Judson leads the Housing Authority for Santa Ana, and he is um, also leads the whole continuum of care for the County of Orange. So he knows a lot about.